It's my honor to invite uh, Professor Jeremy King now, a professor of history at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, uh, received his bachelor degree from Yale and a PhD from Columbia, very good addresses both. And uh, Princeton University Press published uh, for me very, very inspiring book, Budweiser's Into Czechs and Germans, a local history of Bohemian uh, politics. And Jeremy is recently resubmitted an article to the Journal of Mo Modern History related to our topic NTA, who is who national classification in Imperial Austria. So, Jeremy, please. Thank you, Pavel. Can people hear me? Wonderful. Uh, Thank not only Pavel, but Boris and the whole of the team here, uh, ERC Non-Territorial Autonomy uh, at the University of Vienna. I thank you for hosting me and everybody else in what is a very international and multilingual group for three days of discussion. The panel uh, that I'm uh, honored to be on is called uh, NTA Identity and Belonging in Different Settings. I'll specify something that was more implied than stated in my draft that I sent you in July. Uh, that the setting for me is Imperial Austria in the 1870s, when legislators in the crown land of Bohemia launched a very early experiment with non-territorial autonomy, perhaps the first really in modern Europe. The first national autonomy of this kind, non-territorial kind, as opposed, for example, to religious autonomy. The context, which I don't really provide or which comes on the side, uh, I was thinking of a different audience when I wrote that draft, one piece of context is the December Constitution of Austria in 1867, a liberal constitution that provides a full complement of civil rights, of uh, civil liberties for Austrian citizens, uh, so a liberal constitution, but a liberal constitution with a corporatist twist. And that would be the famous or infamous Article 19, uh, which established national rights in addition to individual ones. And I'll just quote a part of that Article 19 for those who haven't seen it. All peoples of the state are equal in their rights and each people has the inviolable right to maintain and to cultivate its nationality and language. And you can look very hard in the French Constitution of 1789, the rights of man, uh, or in the American Constitution a bit later, and you'll find nothing like that. Rather, in the French constitutional environment, there's the famous statement, I think it was already in 1789, by one of the members of the parliament, to the Jews as citizens we give everything. To the Jews as a people, we give nothing, no group rights. But in Austria, there's this beginning, a gesture at least, in the direction of group rights. Another part of this Article 19 is a provision that every citizen of Austria has a right to public education in his or her national language. And uh, uh, an interesting uh, part of that final sentence is a prohibition on any compulsion of an Austrian citizen to learn another language of the land. And what that means, here's a second piece of context for what I wrote. Uh, in Bohemia, which has German speakers and Czech speakers, the school system that starts to develop right away after the 1867 constitution, it develops into two parallel tracks. You have German language schools and you have Czech language schools, but they are separate. The final sentence of Article 9 makes it, you could say, constitutionally prohibited for schools to have both languages simultaneously. So you have parallel uh, schools uh, side by side in some towns. Any, any multilingual, any bilingual town in, in Bohemia is going to have a Czech language school and a German language school separately. Third context of three is the 1873 legislation passed by the Bohemian Diet or uh, Landtag 
uh, SNEM, uh, which provides that in these mixed language municipalities of Bohemia, there will be separate supervision of the Czech language and German language schools. That there will be not one local school board supervising both schools, but there will be two boards, a German board for the German language school and a Czech board for the Czech language school. Uh, David Smith yesterday talking about you know, various democratic or not democratic arrangements. This being not a democratic country in the 1860s and 70s, but rather a liberal one, they do not organize elections to these separate German and Czech school boards by the population. They don't have the Germans elect the German uh, overseers of the school systems and Czechs, over see, uh, oh, Czechs elect the, the, the Czech uh, board members. Rather, they have the municipal council, which is elected only by a, about five or 10% of the population uh, and, and so you have a problem. All of these local uh, municipal governments have uh, usually, well, maybe there's an exception that Pavel will be able to pull out, but for the most part, these municipal councils by the mid 1870s have either a German or a Czech majority. And so if you have this municipal council with a Czech majority, and it's going to decide who's going to serve not only on the Czech board, but on the German board, how do you make sure that, that there are Germans on the German board and Czechs on the Czech board? And the way that they uh, address this problem with the 1873 uh, legislation is they say basically, I'm going to quote, uh, that the municipal council must elect people to each of the nationally partitioned school boards from among the members of that nationality for which the school represented by the local school board is meant. And that's twisted language, but that's exactly what the legislation says. So that the idea behind this legislation, a very early experiment, well before uh, Karl Renner, before Edwin Christan, before uh, um, uh, Otto Bauer, and so on and so forth, and not by social democrats, but by liberals, German liberals, the idea is that Czechs are going to supervise Czech language schools, Germans are going to supervise German language schools in accord with this constitutional principle of national equality of rights. That Czechs and Germans are going to have separate and equal governance mechanisms at the local level, more symbolic than actual, uh, and thereby uh, you will reduce Czech-German conflict, hopefully, and you will strengthen the legitimacy of compulsory schooling. That's the context of my, my essay uh, briefly, and now if I can just summarize it quickly while rearranging it, I tried a, a non-chronological sequencing. I brought up the result in 1881 of a court ruling, and then I went backwards uh, chronologically. I don't think that works so well. So let me take the, the second part of my essay first now, the um, what I call educational necessity, the second chapter really. Uh, it's about two suburbs of Prague, Zizhkov and Weinberge, or Vinohrady, Karlovské Vinohrady, and uh, these are rapidly expanding uh, suburbs, uh, Prague is, is bringing in people from the countryside, they're growing very rapidly, and so is the entire public school system of Austria. And these two suburbs, among others, encounter a new legal doctrine uh, by the Ministry of Education, recently recreated, which is the, the doctrine of, of educational necessity. In a nutshell, this legal doctrine holds that a municipality, a, mu a municipal government, has to open a second school, a second public primary school, using the other language of the land if there are 40 or more resident children who are walking to neighboring municipalities to get instruction in that other language of the land at a public or private school. So in 1875 and 76, Zizhkov and Weinberge are both ordered to add a German language school to the Czech language schools that they recently created at great expense. And the Czechs who dominate the municipal governments in both places resist. They do not want to do that. They file appeals and objections and uh, that is part of what I write about. At the beginning, I need, I need a glass of
So the way I start my uh, second chapter that I sent you is these two long quotes. I think it's on pages 15 and 16. I think they're delicious quotes. The one um, describes, from a Czech perspective, the opening day of the new German language school, February of 1877, in Zizkov. And the description is of all these children walking from their former school in a neighboring municipality to the new school in Zizkov and chattering along the way. And they're chattering in Czech. They don't understand any more than a few words in German, and they're enrolled in the German school. That's the first quote. And then the second quote is um, something that's published in the newspapers as well. It's a letter from the German local school board in Zizkov to the district board saying, we received your communication telling us that as the German local school board, we need to correspond with you in the German language, but we won't and we can't. None of us speak German. What's that about? And they go into some, uh, this, this whole town is Czech speaking, there are no German speakers here. That reality on the ground can then be looked at from the archives and you see in the archives that the Ministry of Education confronted with this situation of a German school board that doesn't know how to speak German, it's in a bit of an awkward situation. The 1873 statute creating these separate school boards says that people have to belong to the correct nationality, but it doesn't say how to do that, how to, how to determine a person's national belonging. And meanwhile, the ministry has got pending court cases where it argues to the highest court in the land that um, it is not possible or necessary to determine the national belonging of children. So that the ministry is, is hoping to defend its educational necessity um, program, which allows it to create German language schools for Czech-speaking children. It doesn't want to admit that they are perhaps not German. Uh, and meanwhile, it's facing the problem of the uh, non-Germans, it seems, running uh, a German school board. What does the ministry do? It sends letters, or it's by way of the Landesschulrat, the, uh, the Crown Land School Board, or the District School Board, but the municipalities, both Weinberge, Vinohrady, and Zizkov, are told, these people who are on the German school board and who have been elected by the municipality, you've got to ask them, you've got to tell them, you've got to require them to declare their nationality. Implied, if they say that they're not German, that's a problem because they can't serve by law. Um, unfortunately, the municipality and several of the electees say there's no basis in law. You can't order us to do that. Furthermore, in the appeal, which is absolutely a remarkable document, the municipality and these electees point out that the people who are being told they should declare their nationality and it should be German, by the way, all of them have children who have been attending German language schools for some time in other municipalities, and it was precisely for their children that this new school was created. How can you require that these people make any statement when, according to the legislation, the people who serve on the board should be for, from the nationality for which the school was created? And the implication is the German school was created for Czechs. Right? So uh, that's quite a difficult situation. There's some internal debate inside the ministry and some very interesting marginal comments by a high-ranking official. He says, you know, basically we're being hoisted by our own petard, and there's the issuance of a decree which says, if an electee to a, a national school board uh, has a child who attends a school of that right language and nationality, then no further investigation will be conducted into that person's national belonging and that person can serve on the board. And I call this my essay uh, with a, uh, a nod toward, I think it was in the 1990s in the United States, the question of uh, uh, 
homosexuals in the United States mili military and whether or not they could serve, don't ask, don't tell. The state will not ask these people if they are Germans. Please don't tell us that you are Czech. For maybe they're not. And you will be allowed to serve and we'll solve this problem. Okay? That's what they do and it's embarrassing. If you look at the legislation of 1873, it's in violation of it and so they issue these decrees, not only for Zizkov in 1877, but for Weinberg in 1878, but they don't publish the decrees and they treat it as a special, <laughs> embarrassing, quiet set of cases. That's the first uh, piece now, that was the second piece before. And now very quickly, as regards Pilsen, just two years later, 1879, uh, just as German liberals are falling from power in the ministries and are being replaced in part by Czechs, a dramatic equalization of the national movements in Bohemia vis-a-vis -vis each other and vis-a-vis -vis the Austrian state. Czechs control the municipal government and they're getting really quite frustrated because there's a funding imbalance. The German schools locally are much better funded than the Czech ones and they're trying to address this and they're meeting with tenacious resistance by very well-funded German elites in the town. And so in 1879 in October, they are well informed about the Zizkov case, probably from reading the Prague newspapers in Czech, and uh, they find an ally, and uh, who seems maybe in Czech, but maybe not, but in any case, willing to vote with the Czech side on things, and that his son attends a German school, and they elect him to the board. They elect him to the local German board. Uh, and the Germans are apoplectic. They don't know about the secret decrees. Uh, they appeal and they are denied. And they appeal again and they are denied again and they appeal again and they are denied again by the ministry itself. The ministry is in trouble. Um, it begins to realize that as knowledge of these decrees circulates, it will put a weapon in the hands of mm, local municipality or municipalities that you can just find somebody who is an ally who has th their child in the other nationality school and then you can pack the local school board of the other nationality and you can dominate uh, the supervision process over the other nationality schools. And this is something that uh, uh, Gerald Stuartz has called Trojan tactics, like the Trojan horse. You can get your people inside uh, running the institution of the other nationality. Three minutes. So uh, I will cut to the chase. Uh, the, the details are in the essay. Um, Yesterday, David Smith enlightened us with a keynote address which carried the title, What, Why, and For Whom? And I'll close by responding to those questions with a quote from one of my favorite authors, a sociologist called Paul Starr. He says, although the conventional hard-nosed view is that politics is about who gets what, or we could say, I think, quoting Lenin, to kavo, uh, the prior question is who, who is? The practical experience generated by Article 19, by the 1873 Bohemian Statute and other legislation alerted jurists to the question, a very difficult question indeed, of how to determine who belonged to which of the nationalities that were going to be separated and treated equally. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Uh, I am very grateful uh, for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to introduce uh, one of the neglected sites of, uh, of the interwar Estonian cultural autonomy. Uh, since non-territorial autonomy is based on personality principle, uh, it is important to know who, uh, who is who. 
who are these individuals to whom uh, the autonom autonomy is granted, and uh, even more importantly, who decides it. Uh, registration practices uh, depend highly on the answer to these questions. Uh, lists like uh, national registers uh, uh, can be compiled uh, by minor minorities, but uh, state authorities may not uh, hand over the control entirely. Uh, this was exactly uh, uh, the case in interwar Estonia, uh, where the Ministry of uh, Interior uh, had the right uh, to refuse the inclusion of those individuals uh, who had not proved their et ethnicity or et ethnic belonging sufficiently. Although uh, uh, cultural self-governments uh, had the right uh, to compile and uh, manage the registers themselves. So uh, in my presentation, uh, uh, I will answer uh, two uh, questions. Uh, how and why uh, such a le legislation was adopted, and uh, second, uh, how this worked in reality. It is a very complex set of issues, and uh, it will be hard to, uh, to explain uh, how all these de details are linked together in a short presentation. But in the end, uh, I hope uh, the puzzle will, will be solved to some extent. Uh, at first, uh, I will give uh, uh, an overview of uh, relevant uh, sections uh, in the legislation to show uh, how state control was designed in the legal level. Then, uh, relying on the parliamentary discussions, uh, I will explain how and why such legislation was established. And finally, I will demonstrate uh, how these regulations functioned in reality and how all this ended. Uh, minority rights in Estonia were basically granted by the constitution and by the law of cultural autonomy. Uh, you can see uh, all the relevant uh, sections of the constitution in the slide, uh, but to get uh, some impressions of minority rights in Estonia, uh, but uh, not all of them are equally relevant uh, for the presentation. So I had uh, highlighted uh, uh, two most important provisions. Uh, first, you can see uh, that uh, section 21 uh, provided for the autonomy, which meant that the parliament was obliged to adopt a special law for this provision to take effect. Uh, but especially I want to uh, emphasize a section that do not directly address minority rights or cultural autonomy, but is nevertheless crucial uh, regarding the main uh, questions of uh, this presentation. It is the section 20, uh, which uh, provides for the right to determine one's, one's own ethnicity. I will demonstrate soon that this section played an important role in shaping the autonomy legislation and was in this regard often misinterpreted. Uh, so, in the autonomy law, adopted after long discussions uh, in the parliament in February 1925, uh, there were several sections uh, that regulate the issue of national registers. Uh, the relevant uh, provisions uh, were elaborated uh, by the regulation on national registers that was issued by the state government several months uh, later in June 1925. Uh, I collected uh, the three uh, most uh, relevant provisions uh, briefly together in the slide. So at first, uh, membership of uh, cultural se self-government had to be voluntary on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, first electoral rolls that formed the basis for the national registry had to be compiled according to the data stored in local municipalities without application or, or initial consent of these people who were included into the electoral roll. They only had the right uh, to apply for removing their names from the list, but of course uh, only if they became aware of, the, uh, aware of it timely, which however was not always the case. So we already see the contradictions in the law, but there is more, uh, there are more controversial aspects of the legislation uh, so the second provisions 
uh, which emerges from the regulation of on national registers is the obligation of individuals who, who wish to be included into the national registry to prove their ethnic belonging and the obligation of uh, cultural self-governments to make sure that only these persons <coughs> who are entitled to, to be included are added to the list. And the third uh, provision was the right uh, of the Minister of Interior to refuse to approve the addition of those people who had not proved their ethnic belonging. Uh, here is important to note that uh, by default, uh, identity cards uh, were used uh, as a proof of ethnicity, uh, since uh, they had uh, a special field uh, for it. However, none of the legal acts explicitly mentioned uh, that identity cards should be used for this purpose. It was purely an administrative practice, probably because there, were, there was uh, no other documents uh, that were uh, more suitable to determine ethnicity. Uh, why it is important? It is important uh, because uh, using identity cards uh, for this purpose was uh, actually inconsistent with the section 20 of the constitution, uh, primarily because it was not clear that uh, this field uh, in the document was filled out according to the wish of individuals. So uh, by these uh, three principles, uh, the control of uh, state authorities over national registers was established. But now, uh, how it was possible that uh, these controversial uh, principles came uh, into force? Uh, first of all, uh, in the parliament, uh, either in the committees uh, or the plenary, establishing uh, a state control over national registers was almost never discussed. Uh, only in the very early stages in 1921 and 1922, this topic was uh, briefly touched upon. Uh, in one of the first draft laws, uh, based on these discussions, uh, some form of state control was, uh, was uh, even included. However, later this was omitted and never emerged in the draft laws again. Uh, therefore, uh, we don't find the direct answer to the main question uh, from, from the minutes of uh, parliamentary sessions, but we still can track the background story of the relevant provisions and make meaningful uh, conclusions. Uh, it was extensively discussed uh, whether inclusion uh, into the national register should be mandatory or voluntary for the individuals. In earlier discussions, uh, mainly in the committee, mandatory registers uh, were rather preferred as they seemed to be the most logical uh, solution uh, based uh, on the assumption uh, that uh, cultural autonomy should uh, be functioning according to the laws of local municipalities. Uh, this means that uh, if someone uh, lives on the territory of a municipality, they have the rights and duties uh, based only on this fact they are living there. And these rights and duties uh, do not depend uh, on their own fish. Uh, so should have this been uh, also with the cultural self-governments. Uh, later, however, opinions uh, changed in the parliament. And now, uh, mandatory registers uh, were considered to be a violation of constitution. Another peculiarity uh, uh, is that, uh, that uh, the parliamentary discussions uh, and the explanatory memorandum of the autonomy law uh, were equating belonging to national registry and to the particular ethnic minority. This fact uh, firstly shows that politicians uh, did not think what, what uh, such an equation means and uh, what its potential consequences will be. And secondly, what the uh, parliament members uh, did not realize very well was the fact that uh, not uh, mandatory registers uh, were a violation of uh, constitution, but equating national registers with belonging to particular ethnic groups. Uh, this was so because uh, these people who considered themselves being members of a particular minority but did not wish to be included into the registry would officially not have been the members of this ethnic group anymore. <laughs> uh, 
there is basically no reason to assume that uh, such equation had some particular aim, but it demonstrates that uh, politicians paid not much attention to such details, but rather were focused uh, on the aim not to let the German minority to gain too much rights with the help of, of autonomy. The main issue reflected in a few speeches in the parliament, but mostly in the wider polemic in the society, was the belief that the Germans tried to assimilate Estonians, and if the state uh, will not uh, fight back actively, then such assimilation would be an existential threat. Now, uh, if Germans uh, had first the right to include into their national register all those people who wished to be included, and second, if the registers were mandatory and all those who had declared themselves being German had been obligatorily included unless they gave up their ethnic belonging, then it was natural to think that uh, such, such a scenario could have potentially forced the assimilation of Estonians into Germans, especially when relying on the knowledge that Germaniza Germanization was indeed uh, before the independence of Estonia widespread. And uh, turning of this trend was slow. Therefore, uh, it is no wonder that the explanatory memorandum of the autonomy law referred to possi possible agitation of minorities if first electoral rolls would, would have been compiled only according to personal applications. Uh, so the logic here was that if those lists are compiled according to the data of the local municipalities, then uh, minorities cannot agitate individuals to register into the electoral rolls. The explanatory memorandum does not mention explicitly that uh, these were Germans who inevitably would, uh, would try to start such an agitation. But knowing the uh, social tensions around uh, all this, uh, it is clear uh, what was behind this statement. So it is already clear that, uh, that the autonomy law was designed to prevent Germans to decide on their own who they consider to be sufficiently own to be included into the national registry. Uh, it did not work out very well, however. Uh, here the regulation on national registers comes into play. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the regulation was uh, issued several months after the autonomy, autonomy law was adopted. Uh, therefore, it actually gave enough time to German elite to call people for registration uh, to electoral roll. Uh, Germans uh, began uh, the preparation for their cultural self-government uh, directly after the autonomy law was adopted. But uh, several regulations that were needed for this process were still lacking. Uh, just uh, in April 1925, a regulation on electoral rolls for elections uh, to the German Cultural Council was issued. And this is one of the most important events uh, that determined following developments. Uh, in one of the early drafts of this regulation, personal application had to be primary in registration. Uh, in such cases, uh, other data, such as the data from the municipality, should not have been used. Uh, this provision was, however, uh, soon replaced uh, with another one, according to which those individuals who wished to be included into the electoral role, but was not German uh, according to municipality data or, or according to their identity cards, had to apply a change in this document. Uh, Important is here uh, that this April regulation did not require proofs of ethnic belonging when applying changes in the identity cards. Uh, this requirement uh, was only included later uh, in the regulation on national registers, which uh, otherwise uh, in several of uh, its provisions was based on this April regulation. Uh, the burden of proof was included into the regulation on national registers because soon after the issuing of April regulation, uh, Germans uh, called people uh, for applying chases uh, in their identity cards and, uh, and also provided uh, the detailed instructions how to do it successfully. Uh, 
what resulted uh, could have actually been expected. Uh, hundreds of people now wanted to change their current uh, uh, ethnicity and identity class to German in order to join uh, the electoral role. The Minister of uh, Interior tried to refuse numerous applications for such changes. Uh, but several people unhappy uh, with, uh, with these uh, decisions went to court and uh, were supported by the German cultural self-government in doing so. As a result, uh, the Supreme Court declared the, the practice of Minister of Interior as unconstitutional, which in reality meant uh, that the Minister of uh, Interior was not able to control the national registers anymore. However, during the authoritarian rule, in 1934, the constitutional freedom to determine one's own ethnicity was almost fully abolished and objective criteria for determining ethnicity uh, were enforced. Uh, the aim of this law was to prevent uh, the assimilation of Estonians into minorities, uh, but at the same time the law explicitly encouraged minorities to declare themselves being Estonians and therefore it was also aimed at assimilating minorities into Estonians. What we see in this case was that historical tensions between Estonians and Germans led not to fully functioning autonomy, but rather created more, more distrust in the society and finally paved the way for the overregulation of ethnic belonging under the authoritarian rule. This overregulation did not favor the minority rights and especially the right to preserve their identity in the same level as it was in the 1920s. And, uh, for the conclusion, I want to emphasize uh, two general patterns that uh, emerge from this story. Uh, firstly, uh, state control over national registers and basically also over ethnic belonging of individuals was established to restrict the freedom of ac action of one particular ethnic group, in this case Germans. Uh, even in minimally similar situations, state authorities may be tempted to guarantee autonomy on the one hand, but on the other hand, they similarly may try to limit the freedom of actions of uh, minority groups with the help of uh, different regulations. So in the end, new regulations and limitations can be something that would not have been, been there without autonomy. However, and uh, as a second remark, it is possible to find legal ways uh, to circumvent the obstac obstacles set by the state authorities. It is possible to find uh, the loopholes in the laws even today, even though the legal frameworks can be extremely different. Uh, so I would end uh, with a rhetoric question whether autonomy is the best solution uh, to reduce tensions if minorities are not trusted enough uh, to decide their own who can be the members of their autonomous institutions. Thank you.